Hi friends. Hope y'all are having a great day today. Um, today I had the pleasure to speak with uh, two of my new friends and they brought up a couple of issues today that, um, well, we're going to go through some of God's Word today and I'm in the book of Colossians. And um, I just want to go through this and touch on some things. You know, <clears throat> when we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, um, we really don't get very much instructions on what we're supposed to do. And from what I have experienced myself, and, and y'all may have experienced something a little different, it sort of goes like this, you know, we, we get saved and we're, uh, we're asked to go to church, pay our tithes, you know, we sing and we go home and we do that Sunday, Sunday night and used to do it Wednesday, but Wednesdays is now, you know, that's, we don't do Wednesday service. So, but what are we supposed to be doing? You know, there is a work. There is a job to do. Uh, the fields are white for harvesting. And Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, does not change. He came to bring salvation and he also came to teach his disciples how to minister like he ministered. And we should also expect to minister as a Christian the same way that Christ, who is our champion, ministered. And if you want to get a good idea, just read the book of Acts, and that really will help us understand what being a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, is all about. And the things that I mentioned uh, earlier, yes, that is a small part of it. You know, uh, it was said, I think, to the Corinthians, it said, you know, I was ready to give you meat, but you wasn't ready for it. I had to continue to give you milk. Well, you know, doing the, you know, love, love the neighbor as you love yourself and, uh, you know, treat others the way you want to be treated and going to church and paying tithes, those things are kind of like the milk of God's Word. But once you grow in maturity, we have a responsibility um, to do something for the Lord. When Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also, and greater works shall you do because I go to the Father. Right there, God said, you've got a work to do. I have a work to do. And the works that we do are going to be greater works than what Jesus accomplished because he went to the Father. And we're going to be able to accomplish these greater works because Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Jesus Christ has sent his Holy Spirit to live and guide us. So let's find out tonight. And I know that's about three or four minutes worth of, uh, you know, um, talking about it before we get in. But I just kind of want to give you an introduction as to which way I wanted to go and what uh, train of thought I want to go with this tonight. And, um, you know, 
I've been making so many videos lately about, you know, the rapture and the end times, and, and they are on us. But what little time we've got left, whether it's an hour, a day, a week, a month, no matter how much time we got left, there is still a work to do. And, but with all of that, let's uh, get into God's Word. And I'm going to pick up in Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, 2 12. Paul said, Having been buried with him, meaning Jesus Christ, in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised Christ from the dead. Listen carefully to this. And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive through Christ and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us. It was opposed to us. And God has taken this out of the way by nailing it to the cross. Let me kind of explain real quick what that is. We had a debt of sin that was against us as, a, as humanity. And we had a debt of sin. The sins that I've committed, the sins you've committed, there was a, a debt and it had to be paid with death, with life. And of course, you know, Jesus Christ took our death and gave us his life. But here it just Paul was just kind of covering over this that he has made us alive with Christ and he the Father has forgiven us all of our trespasses. He has totally erased it with all of its obligations. Keep that word in mind, all of its obligations that was against us opposed to us and he has taken it totally out of our way by nailing it to the cross. I'll tell you something else the father did. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them by him, meaning by Christ. Listen, the devils, the demons, the authorities that was demanding that we go to hell, demanding that we will be lost for eternity. God, through what Jesus Christ did, totally disarmed, removed the weapons that Satan had against us. He disarmed them. They are powerless towards us. If they take power over us, it's only because we give them that power. And how do we give them the power over us? By not knowing what God's word says about us. Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. The Holy God lives inside of us. The fallen demon, Satan, who's the God of this world, has been disarmed. I'm telling you, my friend, according to God's word, we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loved us, who gave himself for us. We are victors through Jesus Christ. The Bible plainly says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous 
run into it and are safe. When you call the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, when you call upon Jesus Christ, my friend, you go into the power of the mighty name of Jesus. And there ain't a demon in hell that can touch you. My friend, the name of Jesus is a strong tower. The righteous run into it in a safe. The righteous. The unrighteous can't use the name of Jesus. Because that is showed in the book of Acts when this guy said, in the name of Paul, in the name of Jesus, blah, blah, blah. You, you come out of this person. He tried to cast a demon out of somebody using the name of Paul or in the name of Jesus and or, or however he said it. Man, that demon, that person, demon possessed, jumped on that man, almost killed him. <laughs> you don't use the name of Jesus. You don't have no right to use the name of Jesus unless you're a blood-bought child of the Most High God. And when you are, brother, the name of Jesus is there for your use. That right there ought to make one or two of y'all shout. Because I tell you, it makes me almost want to run around this house. <laughs> but I won't do that. Okay. Verse 16. This is where we're going to put to bed regulations against us therefore for this reason because God put this certificate of debt that was against us he nailed it to the cross the cross of Jesus and it says in verse 16 therefore for this reason do not let anyone judge you in regard to food, drink, or in the matter of a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath day. Did I just read that? You mean to tell me? That if I don't keep, if I don't eat a certain kind of food and drink a certain kind of drink. Now, come on. I ain't talking about getting drunk here. That ain't what we're talking about. Or a festival. If I don't keep a certain festival the right way. Or when the new moon comes. Or keeping the Sabbath. What does that mean? Am I going to go to hell? Is that sinning? My friend, it plainly says right here in God's word that all of the obligations, the obligations, these things that was against us on top of the sins, all of these things, he has taken it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Verse 17 said that these things, which I just mentioned, are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is Christ. Let me explain this to you. But I want to tell you this first so you can have this in your mind when I tell you this. The Bible plainly says that the law that God gave was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Simply meaning <laughs> the people that did not have the law were the people before the flood. And we saw what those people happened to them living lawlessly. They were without a law. 
They didn't know right from wrong. And you know what? Their flesh huh, got more wicked and wicked and wicked because they didn't have a law. There was nothing written that says you can do this, you can not do this. You must do this, you should not do this. I want you to be here on this day for this amount of time to just like, like God's word says, it was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Because you see, the law was given to men and women and humans that did not have a born again heart, that was not born again spiritually. They were spiritually dead to God. They did not have God through the Holy, Holy, Holy Spirit living inside of them, leading and guiding them. They had to go by a list of do's and don'ts to keep them somewhat uh, how can you say it? Uh, moral standards to keep them from don't don't kill, don't steal, don't do this, don't do that. You can do this, you can't do that. But when Jesus Christ came, the rich man came to him and said, "What's the greatest commandments?" What's the greatest commandments? I've kept them all. Jesus says, great. Go sell everything you have. Give to the poor and come and follow me. The rich man bowed his head and went away sorrowful. Even though he did and kept the law, he claimed, he loved his money more than he loved God. No wonder he went away sorrowful. He wanted God, but he wanted his money too. And who won his money? No wonder Jesus said how hard it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. You cannot serve God and mammon, which is riches, because you will love one, hate the other. You will hold on to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both. You're either going to serve God and be willing to lose everything. But let me tell you, when you <laughs> thank you, Lord. When you have God, you have everything. Money, money is worthless compared to the relationship you have with God. You know, when you have Jesus Christ in your heart, the Bible says you have the fullness of the Godhead because Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead and when you have Jesus Christ my friend you have God some people don't want to believe that Jesus is God my friend Jesus plainly says when you've seen me you've seen the Father so don't let that lie from Satan be entertained in your mind. Jesus Christ is God. There was nothing made that wasn't made unless Jesus Christ made it. Because the Bible says all things was made by him and for him. So, now that we're way out here, let's come on back to what we was just discussing. All of these rules and all of these regulations that was put in place 
was to try to keep some type of humanity or morals to these people until the time through the ages that Jesus Christ could come. I want you to think of this. Before God gave uh, Moses the Ten Commandments, told him to come up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, what did they do? Do you think they were down there waiting patiently for Moses to come back with the law of God? No. Those, do you dare say heathens? rebellious took the gold and made a golden calf started worshiping it got drunk did ungodly sexual acts <laughs> God said Moses you better get on down there they messing up well you know the story made Moses so mad he broke the first set of commandments had to go back up and get a second set that right there shows you that without the law and the rebirthed or reborn or resurrected spirit of the man made by God you're going to fall into sin you're going to do what comes natural to this flesh. And that's sin, sin, and more sin. But, as this says, Jesus Christ, in verse 17, is the substance. And these regulations was the shadow. You know, if you follow a shadow... It will take you to what's casting the shadow. And Jesus Christ was the substance. God was just trying to get humanity to the day that Jesus Christ could come to pay the penalty of our sins once and for all that we could be born again. That this spirit of the man that is dead because of sin can be resurrected. If you have not been resurrected, the spirit that's inside of you, if that has not been resurrected, by God, my friend, you're still lost and without Christ in this world. That is the reason why Jesus Christ said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. There's something inside of you that has to be resurrected. Something inside of you has to come back to life. And that is your spirit, the spirit man inside of you. And when God resurrects the spirit inside of you, you become alive to God. You become alive to God. And now the link has been reestablished between you and God. And on top of that, he gives you his Holy Spirit to lead and guide and strengthen your inner spirit. That's the reason why the Bible says that the flesh lusts against your spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary to each other and you can't do what you want to do. But the Holy Spirit strengthens your inner spirit and if you will lean on the Holy Spirit you will do what Paul said I buffet my body daily 
lest after preaching to others, I myself should become a castaway. Verse 18. Let no one disqualify you, insisting that you go through ascetic practices, which means severe self-discipline, and the worship of angels, which obviously that was a practice back then, claiming that they had access to a visionary realm and they were inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. Obviously, there was a practice back then where people were worshiping angels. Angels. Now, we don't worship angels. We don't pray to angels. We don't pray to people. We pray to Jesus Christ, our God, our Savior, our Lord. Verse 19. He doesn't hold on to the head, that's Jesus, from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons, develops with growth from God. This is where we're going to put this to bed once and for all. If, <clears throat> big word there, if. If you died with Christ to the elemental forces of this world, the basic forces of this world, why do you still live as if you belong to the world? Now, my friend, right here, listen. <laughs> this small group of words is profound truth. And I'm going to tell you right now, you want a key? Do you want the key? A key? To walking with God? I'm talking about where you get up in the morning and you live your life walking with God like Adam and Eve did in the cool of the day they walked with God do you want a life like that grab hold to what we're about to discuss if you died with Christ have you been born again if you have then you have died with Christ to the elemental forces of this world keep that word in your mind this world the world why then do you live as if you still belong to this world let me ask you this do we live like we belong to this world <laughs> you better believe we do how many of us has to go out and watch the newest movie is it a Christian movie? Or is it going to have cuss words in it? Is it going to have a mild nudity in it? We have died to this world. Why do we live like we still belong to it? Do we have to have the newest uh, fad that a like Nike, when they come out with their newest shoes, do we have to go buy a pair? Do we have to? No. When the newest designer shirts come out, do we have to go buy shirts like that? Do I dare say when the new designer pocketbook comes out do we have to go get one you say oh brother that, that you gone to meddling now you gone to stepping on my toes no sir no ma'am i ain't stepping on nobody's toes because uh I, I hate to tell you this i didn't write god's word i just asked you a question do you want to walk with god in the cool of the day 
Do you want God's presence on you so strong that you can do the works which Jesus Christ said you can do? Greater works? Do you think for one minute Jesus Christ entangled himself with the affairs of this world? Or was he about his father's business? When mama, Mary, went looking for little Jesus, searched for him all day, and they came back to Jerusalem. Where did they find him? Where did they find him? They found him where he was all day long. They should have went there first. He was in his father's house. He was in the temple. Close to the Holy Spirit. You know... <laughs> When you love God, you want to be close to Him. When you love the Holy Spirit, you want to be close to Him. You know, when Jesus was in the temple, He was hidden away from the world. He was hidden away from everything that was going on in Jerusalem of that day. He was about His Father's business. So like the scripture says, if you die with Christ to the elemental forces of this world, why do you still live as if you belong to this world? Why do we get wrapped up with all of the distractions and all of the uh, things that they try to, you know, get us to go after? Just look around, my friend. This world is designed to separate you from God, a close relationship. That's what it's designed for. Because the one that's pulling the strings of this world is the God of this world. And he was clever enough to get Adam and Eve to sin and disobey God. And he's clever enough to make this world so attractive that we Christians, we still act like the world. We're part of the world. We do the things of the world. We want everything that others got. When the Bible plainly says to come out from among the world and be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. I will receive you and be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters. <laughs> Verse 21. Well, back up just a little. Why do you submit to regulations? Why are you submitting? See, there it is. You are submitting yourselves. You, it has no control over you. You do not have to submit yourself to the regulations that we have been set free of. Why do you submit to regulations? Don't handle. Don't taste. Don't touch. All of these regulations refer to what is destroyed by being used up. They are human commands and doctrines. Human commands and doctrines. Although, now key point, although these things have a reputation among people, among the religious group, that, hey, if you do these things, you know, you have wisdom by promoting ascetic practices. It makes you look like you have humility and because you are treating your body severely. Oh, look at him. He, he's a holy person. You know, he, he does this and he does that and he doesn't do this. No, no. All of these things, the regulations has no value. No value whatsoever against fleshly indulgence. It's not what you do on the outside of your body. 
See, you could go to your church on a certain day or go to your place of worship on a certain day, never be late. And and they and they tell you to you can do this, you can't do that, wash your hands and do this and do that. That has no none whatsoever value against fighting the indulgence of the flesh. Won't do it. Let me tell you how the, you fight the flesh. You get in God's Word and you stay there. You read God's Word. Because, brother, when you're reading God's Word, you're going to have a hard time cussing somebody out. You walking around with God's Word in your hand, you're going to have a hard time lusting over another person. You reading God's Word, you're quoting, singing to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to God. You ain't going to have no time to let your flesh act crazy. You know why? Because the Bible says when you draw nigh unto God, God draws nigh unto you. And the devil flees. The problem is, we don't stay in God's word. Sir, ma'am, how much time have you spent this day reading God's word? An hour, five minutes, 30 minutes, or I was too busy. I had to see what was on TV. I had to go whatever. My friend, if we are too busy to spend time with God each and every day, we are way too busy. God is too far down your list of priorities. I'm telling you, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit ought to at least take up the first 10 spots of your life. The first 10. Everything else can fall in at 11. If you have to say, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, you say, man, <laughs> no, let me, let me tell you this. Jesus Christ died on the cross and hung there for six hours for us. Six hours for us. We're all excited about wanting to go to heaven. We're all excited about the rapture. But yet, we have a hard time opening God's word and reading it. We have a hard time getting alone and meditating and praying. My friend, I, I got news for us. There's not going to be any cell phones in heaven. That's going to hurt our feelings. There's not going to be any Facebook. <laughs> Seriously, folks. It's all about loving Jesus Christ. With all our heart. With all our soul. With all our mind. And all our strength. That's what it's all about. Do you know which disciple of the day was probably considered the craziest one? John. How many times did we read that John would just lay his head on the lap of Jesus? John was laying his head on the lap of God. John had an understanding 
I want to get as close to my God as possible. I mean, he'd get all close. How many of us has, when we were as children, we'd get all close to our mama, our daddy, and we'd fall asleep and just kind of let our head fall over and fall asleep on their, their chest or fall asleep on their lap or lay our heads in their lap and take a nap. You just want to be close to someone you love. That was John. Those other, <laughs> those other disciples talking about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. John wasn't worried about that. John said, "Y'all, y'all can whatever you want. Y'all can argue amongst yourself. I'm laying here with God. I'm laying here with my Savior. I'm laying here with my Lord." I tell you what, don't think for one minute that Jesus Christ did not appreciate the love that John had for him. Those men were worrying about them, their own selves. Well, Jesus, what are, what are you going to give me for serving you? That's kind of like how some of our churches are today. You know, God, you know, what are you going to give me? What are you going to give me, God? If we got what we're supposed to get, we'd all still be in hell, going to hell. We don't deserve salvation. We're sinners. We have been sinners. We don't have to sin now, but we were sinners. We all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. My friend, I promise you, I'm not trying to sound like I'm beating you up or beating myself up because I, I can promise you, if you think I'm talking to you, nah, I'm talking to myself. <laughs> when that camera ain't rolling, I, I live my life daily talking to myself like this. When I'm at work, I you know, when it says to speak to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Don't think for one minute the Holy Ghost living inside of me. I I don't do like Paul did. He said that he buffets his body. Well, I don't walk around beating myself up. But I do keep myself before God's word. And when I know I've messed up, man. You know, I just, I just have to ask God, Lord, I, I have did something that has took the smile off of your face. And that alone is, is a terrible thing that you've done something to grieve the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us do not grieve the Holy Spirit. I'm going to bring this video to a close here, but first I just want to go through just a couple of verses rather quickly. In 1 Peter chapter 4, starting at verse 1, Therefore, for this reason, since Christ suffered in the flesh, we are to arm ourselves with the same resolve. Because the one who suffered in the flesh has finished with sin. In order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desires. Oh, Lord. Did you hear what God's word just said? Because the one who suffered in the flesh has finished with sin. Why? See, we're done with sin. Our sin was taken care of on the cross. 
Now, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to be doing? How do we serve God? Verse 2. In order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desires, but for God's will. My friend, that is it. That is it. Get you a marker. Mark that right there. That is what you and I are to be doing 24-7, 24-7, 24-7, 365 days a year, even on leap year or leap day. We are to no longer live our lives for human desires. Human desires, but for God's will. The same way that Jesus said, not my will, Father, but your will be done. Do you know that Jesus Christ did not do his will? He did the Father's will, but of course, his will and the Father's will was one. But still, when it comes to that point of actually doing it, suffering, he said, if it's possible, let this cup pass. But if not, I'm going I'm to drink the cup. I'm going to take the pain. I'm going to be crucified. Friend, you and I are commanded by God's word to do God's will. And I'm telling you, doing God's will is not living in the world. It's not acting like the world. It's not talking like the world. Listen to this. Verse 3, because there has already been enough time spent in doing the will of the pagans, carrying on in unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and lawless idolatry. In regard to this, they meaning the people of the world, are surprised that you don't plunge with them into the same level or flood of dissipation. And why? They slander you because of it. Yet they, these wicked people, will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. Now, friend, I'm going to end it right there. There ain't nothing else to be said. I tell you what, if this right here don't make you want to get up and shout, listen, there's been enough time spent in our past living like the world, talking like the world, acting like the world. My friend, we are all excited and rightfully so, that we are living in the days just before the rapture of the church. And if there's ever been a day that the children of God need to talk like God, act like God, and do the works of God, meaning we are to act like Jesus, talk like Jesus, Love like Jesus and do the works of Jesus. That is who we are to be. We are Christians. And we are to be like little Christ walking around. I didn't say we are Christ. But my friend, when a person comes up to you like a man did to me today, and said, brother, I'm hungry. Yes, sir? Well, what can I do for you? Would you buy me some food? Yeah, I'll buy you some food. So I went and bought him some food. You think for one minute I was going to turn away that deal? No, sir. Oh, no, sir. 
Because I'm telling you something, everything said and done in your body is being recorded. I've done some pretty bad things, and you probably have to, before I accepted the Lord. Some after I accepted the Lord. Thank God that we could ask for forgiveness. But a man comes up saying he's hungry, don't have no food. You don't think for one minute I'm not going to feed him? You better believe it. If there ain't anything the Lord said, he said, remember the poor. Remember the poor. Because my friend, at one time we were poor. We were poor. We were lost. And I'm not talking about financial, your, your financial uh, status. I'm talking about when we were dead in our sins, we were poor. Friend, the richest man on the face of this earth is not the guy that's got the biggest amount of money or the largest amount of money in a bank account. It's the person that walks the face of this earth that is closest to God. That's who is the most wealthiest person on the face of this earth. Whoever that soul is that is closest to God, he or she is the wealthiest person on this earth. You know, Jesus said in the book of Revelation, he says, you think you're rich and you're increased with goods and you got this, that, and other, and you don't re realize that you are blind, naked, poor, and miserable. Why? Because you don't have God. My friend, if you don't have God, you have nothing. This whole video is one purpose and one purpose only to hope to help focus you and me Praise God on what on what we're supposed to be doing in these final days. We have got to come, the Bible says, into the fullness of the stature of Christ. That's what the Bible says, that we are to come into the fullness of the stature of Christ. We have got to get out here among the world and be Jesus to this lost and dying world. That's, that is our ministry. It is called the ministry of reconciliation. And you can't do it. Living like the world. Talking like the world. Involved with the world. Worrying about designer clothes. Designer jewelry. Buying a new car, buying a new house, building onto your house. No, no. It's too late for that, friend. It, I'm sorry. It's too late for that. It is too late in the game to be worrying about trying to go build a house. Now, don't get me wrong. For goodness sake, don't get me wrong. If you need a house, build a house. But don't be like the man with the barn. He had barns. And he had such a great bumper crop that he tore down those barns to build bigger barns. And he said, you fool, today your soul is required of you. He died. You know, he already had all he needed. God blessed him with an abundance and the old stingy rascal wouldn't give it to nobody. He was going to tear down his barns and build bigger barns just to keep it all to himself. Listen, when God blesses you and, and, and all your needs are met, God wants you to remember the poor. God wants you to use your blessings to be a blessing to others. You know that. My friend, I don't know about you, 
But I have thoroughly enjoyed this talk that I had. And right now, I am just sitting here talking to a, a little computer. This might not even get two or three views. But I know this. I have felt the Lord's presence through this whole video. And it's like 2, 2 o'clock in the morning, 2.30 in the morning. When your child's asleep and your cat's asleep and there's just you and the Lord having a good time in His Word, hey, we've had a good time tonight. The Lord is here. And I pray that you who might be watching this video, I dare say this video won't even get watched by 150 people. Keep, keep a watch on the account. Because in the description, it's not going to say anything about the coming of the Lord or a rapture or anything like that. Because this isn't about the rapture. This is about living the life that Jesus Christ has set before us. I'm not sure what I'm going to title it yet, but but keep an eye on the count. You know, this, a video like this, is one that I wish had a million views because this world needs to hear God's Word. Not sugar-coated, not politically correct, the uh, way the Holy Spirit wrote it is the way it needs to be presented. Presented in love and kindness. Not yelling, not hollering, but presented in love without any ulterior motives. And that's what I've tried to present to you. My brother and my sister that's watching this video, I pray to God that you have felt the Holy Spirit's presence. That's what I hope. And I hope that you will dig deeper into God's Word and you will spend more time in God's Word every single day. If you ate breakfast or lunch or supper today, if you have fed this fleshly body Feed your spiritual body. Feed your spirit. Not just the milk of God's word. Get on in there and get the meat. Get the meat of God's word. Slow down enough to find out what God's word is really saying. That's when it begins to change you. When you say, oh, goodness, I didn't know that was in there. Let me tell you, God's Word is quick, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. It will pierce your heart, and it will divide you, your spirit from your flesh. God's Word wants to kill the desires of your flesh. So that the Holy Spirit can grow strong in you and you can walk in the power of the Holy Ghost and do the work that Jesus Christ did. That's what it's all about. I love you and God bless you, my dear friend.